I, I always enjoy the Reader's Theater, and we've got a couple more of those coming up as we're in this series. But before I begin, I, I, need, the, I need the children to come up and help me out with this, this part of the service. If I can have children come up, especially those who are third graders. Hey, you guys getting ready for school to start? You, you're gonna, you've already started? And you'll you'll be able to answer my questions. Oh, you'll be able to answer my questions today. And you, you did you have you gotten school supplies? You get school supplies, yes. and you get get all sorts of things for school, and maybe backpacks and pencils and papers and calculators. And when you get to school, now when I was a kid, they, they did school a little differently. We read we read from books and things like that. And they would give us books on the first day. You know what they were called? Text textbooks. Have you gotten textbook yet? No, I'm not starting school. Yet. Oh yeah, did you get a textbook yet? No, no Jackson, no textbook. Well, you know, you get a textbook, and and back when I was a kid, they wanted to save it for your generation, so they made us. They made us. But what? What's a gener generation? Generation for your for my children and my children's children and all those people after me. So we used to have to make book covers to put on top of them, right? So that they would, oh, they would say, stay, stay really good and nice and clean while we used them, and you, you could never write in them. Now, we have a textbook in the church. We have a book we use as a textbook in the church. Do you know what that book is called? What? The Bible. The Bible? You go with that? You go with, how many vote for the Bible? Okay, I thought maybe it was a compilation of sermons by Pastor Tom Van Zandt. No, that's not it. <laughs> no, no, that's the comic strip. <laughs> no, 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 it's the Bible. And so when people get to around third grade, when people get around third grade, we, we think they can start to read. And one of the things that's really important to read uh, is your Bible. Bible. Your Bible, that's right. That's really important to read is your Bible. And and so we at the church, we want to present to you, in the, the, to our third graders, and maybe those who are beyond third grade, Bibles today. And there's another slide. Rob, can you go to that one? We've got some, we've got, we've got these folks here to get a Bible today. And they're all, they're, they're right here, and they've got names on them. Here's Marley's. You guys see this, Oliver, here's yours. And then we're going to have a prayer over these. And when you guys, now what, what grade are you in? Second. So when will you get to third grade? In a couple of years? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next year. Next year. <laughs> And then, and 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 if you're past third grade, let us know. What, what, what grade are you in? Third, whatever grade it is, doesn't matter. Those are things. Those are things they don't tell people. John Riley. So you, you know, here you are. Oh, you were right in front of me. That was a problem. You were there, Laney. No, it's, no, he's not here. Kayla is not here. Okay. We'll uh, we'll get. And if we need to get anybody else Bibles, we will. But we want to have a prayer over these Bibles. Okay. So can we all hold hands? And if you're out in the pew, there might be a Bible in front of you in the pew, or you might have brought yours. Can you hold hands? No, never hold hands with strangers. How about this? Can you hold hands with me? Here, come here. Do you want to hold hands with the boy? There we go. There you go. Okay. God, I am so thankful for these children, and I'm thankful that we can give them these Bibles. May they read them and learn your word and your way for their lives. And may they live it out so that we can show it to everybody. I pray your blessing on these children through your son, Jesus Christ. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. If you guys go to the back, there's, I'll uh, go, go back there with Miss Jackie. Yeah, can you take Adeline's too? And her mom. Well, that's fine. She didn't get one in third grade, so we'll give her another one. So that'll be good. <laughs> oh, dear. <clears throat> I, I never work with children or animals. That's what they say. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I want to start off, though, with our 618 prayer, 618 verse. We read this is from Ephesians 618. And then we'll say a brief, brief prayer for our church. Uh, read this with me, would you, friends? Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. 
God, we are thankful for Wesley United Methodist Church here in Jefferson City, that we can gather and worship you, that we can experience your spirit, that we can find ways of reaching out to our friends, our neighbors, and our relatives with your love and your grace, that you can once again show us the truth of your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we seek to worship here, we pray that you open our hearts and our minds as we explore your scriptures and your ways. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, we are in the uh, third week of the, the series, a series of Shel Silverstein. We're going through several Shel Silverstein books, and uh, and he was, uh, you know, quite a poet, and uh, or he is quite a poet, and uh, always kind of amazing. I think there's a certain number of insights. Now, one of the things that I that I have neglected to put in here is that that we are tracing our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm using Shel Silverstein's poems as a way to kind of highlight and kind of give us an understanding of some of the things that, that Matthew is talking about and the way Matthew is, is presenting Jesus Christ to us and the words of Jesus Christ to us in that way. Now, and I, I like, this, I like this, first, this first poem in this book, the, in, the Light in the Attic. I don't know, you know, as a preacher, it happens to me. It happened to me when I was a parishioner and sitting in the pews. And, uh, if you've ever been a teacher, we get to, uh, we're, we're honoring teachers. We're starting to honor teachers as they go back to school and everybody. And as we have the tree out there with a number of pictures of teachers, we hope we, we pray for the, the teachers and students returning this week. And, and, and sometimes, when you when you st- when you start to talk, the eyes just sort of glaze over. Sometimes you get a little bit further in, and you can tell that people don't quite always get it. You you always wonder. You always wonder. Uh, you know, I, I always wonder if 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 I if I'd follow if I'd follow some folks to the restaurant after here, would they be just a little bit better? Would we be just a little bit nicer for going to church? Or 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 when we go out, do we kind of just turn back on our our world? And I think the light in the attic talks about that in that there's there's a light in the attic and that's that the eternal hope that God talks about uh, inside us though the house is dark and shuttered and so many of us in our lives can't we we try to protect that light by shuttering the house and by by not making ourselves vulnerable in this life you know it's it's hard to love like Jesus because the world isn't like Jesus and and it makes us feel like we kind of have to close up just a little bit it says i can see a flicker or a flutter. Oh, I, I was I over half of my over half of my pastoral career. Um, I, I've uh, I've hit um, the 25th year of ordination uh, at annual conference this this last year. That's the ordination as elder. I've been almost I've been almost 30 years in full time ministry, and over half of that time I was either in 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 campus ministry on a college campus or in uh, in. In youth ministry, I did youth ministry, and I, I've, I've got to tell you, you got to love youth ministry, particularly junior high youth ministry. I guess we'd call it middle school youth ministry today. Oh, you can you can do anything, and they will they will get you off track somehow. The those the the middle schools. Oh, and the middle schoolers. I mean, when when you when. When I got to preach to regular adults and everybody, everybody's so nice, and and, and I'm and I'm pretty sure I, I, because when you when you do junior high lesson, I, I can guarantee you there'll be somebody going out and they'll say that was the most boring thing I ever heard, or they'll say that was terrible, that was terrible. I'll see, I'll see you next week. Yeah, I wouldn't miss it for the world. And and, and, and whereas whereas when you when you when you talk to adults, oh, even I'm I'm pretty convinced when my sermon is the worst is when most people think I need the most encouragement in the back and they say the nicest things as they go out. Uh, but, but, and, uh, but, but you hope you have this light in the attic and we're, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew and, and, and there's this truth that he presents about Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew. They, there's this truth that kind of sets down. Now, if you know the structure of that Gospel, there are, there are four biographies of Jesus. We call them all Gospels, which means good news. And, and and the first one is Matthew, and Matthew was is the one that was kind of chosen by the church and is considered the Hebrew uh, 
uh, gospel, if you will. Matthew's the one who, who shows the most continuity between the Old Testament and then the New Testament. It's structured like the first five books of the New Testament. It comes in five sections, Matthew does. And, and, he, and he starts off, he starts off even with a genealogy of all things, showing that there's a whole structure of the universe. Matthew is about this structure. And then immediately he goes into the, the birth narratives that we read at, at, at Christmas time, that we read in the Advent season. Uh, but, but he's always connecting those very intentionally. Uh, where where Luke's, Luke's is always connected to the spirit, Matthew is always connected to the history, if you will. Matthew understands uh, that, that if you understand, if you have the wisdom, you'll be able to see it. So, so who shows up in Matthew's uh, birth narratives? It's the wise men. It's the smart people. They're all showing up here in Matthew's gospel. And then, and, and then, then, then Matthew has Jesus kind of present his, his vision, his mission statement in, the, in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, I got an amen corner over there. <laughs> he goes, the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, I scream every time I hear Sermon on the Mount too. Yay! <clears throat> he has a Sermon on the Mount, and there he's laying out, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who, uh, you know, who, who are persecuted for my name's sake, the, those blessed statements. And then there's, there's, that, uh, there, there's all sorts of wisdom that we put in there, that I am, you're the salt of the earth, and, and you never light a candle, and you want to put it on a hill, and all those kind of wisdoms that go in for, for, for three chapters is a Sermon on the Mount. And then Matthew has the disciples kind of picked after that, after Jesus is sort of laid out in this sort of, in, the, in this very systematic fashion, what's going to go on? Then he picks the disciples. And then in the, uh, the 11th chapter, and interspersed through the, all that is, is Jesus' teaching and then miracles that happen. Jesus' is teaching and then something amazing happens. So, so there's this connection all the way through it. But there in, the, there in the 11th chapter, Matthew does something, Matthew presents Jesus doing something unusual right here. He, he highlights a part of Jesus' teaching right that, that, that you wouldn't really expect in the middle of it. Uh, and, and, and in the middle of it, Jesus starts to talk. And Jesus is, is putting forth uh, 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 the teaching and who's going to hear it. Because, because like the light in the attic, Jesus is preaching to people, but there's kind of a glazed over look, particularly among some, some people, if you will. And Jesus knows, Jesus knows in the midst of it that, that you have to start you have to start any preaching or teaching. You have to start any instruction you do. You have to start, and, and this is this is the way you all always ought to look at it. Whenever you start anything, you have to start to you have to begin with gratitude, don't you? You have to begin with gratitude. And so, so Matthew starts this section in, in chapter eleven. At that time, Jesus said, and, and read it with it. What did Jesus say, friends? These th first three three words. I thank you. He starts off thanking, just as th thanking uh, God, thanking the Father, if you will. Jesus starts with that sense of gratitude and and the gratitude and the sense of who God is. God is the Lord of heaven and earth, which which we might find just a little bit unusual because uh, Jesus is God, and, and, and Jesus is going to get to that right away. Uh, but he's demonstrating to us all the way through what we should do and what we ought to do. Uh, th this whole section starts off with John the Baptist questioning who Jesus is. Uh, John the Baptist and all the Pharisees and everything questioning what's going on. Uh, and, and so Jesus starts off with this, this, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. A and then I love this next section. And, and, and it, it kind of resonates with me and you can almost feel it. You kind of wish you could have this attitude, wouldn't you, whenever anything is going wrong in your life right before you. Because here people and they're not hearing what Jesus is doing. They're starting to misinterpret what he's doing. They're starting to think that Jesus came to make them better, to make them more important people when Jesus came to make them better people, if you will. And in Jesus said, I thank you, Father in heaven, I like it, because you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. 
But God, what, what he's saying is only the, the, people who, the people who should have known it, the people who should have known it even before I said it, aren't even seeing it and hearing it. Only those people who come with a humble heart uh, see it. But Jesus starts with that th- sense of thanks. Starts with that th- sense of thanks of God. I don't know about you, but I would be kind of frustrated. I'd be like, God, you've given me these people who aren't listening. And if, if you look at the prophets before them, that's what they're saying. These hard-hearted people, they're not listening. But instead he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven, because, because some of these people aren't getting it. But maybe because they're not getting it, these other people will get it. You see, that's where Jesus starts because Jesus also knows you begin with gratitude because Jesus knows who he is. He's the son of God. Now, that's pretty easy for Jesus. I mean, uh, if you are the son of God, you kind of know everything. But what's maybe more important is Jesus knows who we are in the midst of it. And, and this is where, where he kind of makes, once again, he continues to make that turn, if you will, something unusual. He's made this intellectual argument all the way to this point. He's made this argument that you should be able to see that Jesus was coming. It should be as obvious as the solar eclipse coming to happen here. He says, but so many people have missed it. Only those who are humble and have an open heart to Jesus, open heart to God, open heart to God's Spirit, are hearing it. And then he says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. You see, all things have been given to God by who? By the Father. By God Himself is what things have been given to Jesus Christ. And that, that, that Jesus himself, in his life and in his action, reveal God's glory and God's love. And, and so God, Jesus knows who he is, but what's maybe even more important, what's even, even, even better, is Jesus knows who we are. Jesus knows who we are in the midst of it. And that we can do the same thing because Jesus has handed it over to us in what we do. Maybe not always with the attitude we have, but that God's glory can be, we we can participate in God's kingdom by revealing the glory. And, and, and you think, well, well, that's pretty tight and, and are pretty tough. And, and what, what's weird is back then, if you were going to follow a rabbi, you might hear, and maybe it's like that at school too. Have you ever signed, did you ever sign up for a class? And they said, that's the toughest teacher in the school, or that's the, that's going to be one of the hardest classes. Now I never looked forward to that and thought, oh, I'm going to learn more. I always thought I'm going to get worse grade. But, uh, but, but, but if you're studying, if you're studying underneath a rabbi, maybe you'd want the toughest rabbi. So you knew that you would learn the most, but, but Jesus is continuing to turn that instead of saying this is hard to understand what he's saying all the way up to this point is this is obvious to everybody that God's love and God's glory has come down through Jesus Christ and if there's something new going on a a new possibility and and even though the smart people even though the people up in the temple don't quite get it you can get it right here And you don't have to know all those things. You don't have to see all those clues that even Matthew is presenting up until this point and will continue to present. You 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 don't need to do that because Jesus Christ is going to do the work for you through the Holy Spirit. And he says to him, he says to him, so don't let, don't let that be a burden to you. Don't let the difficulty or how big a leap it seems to make to be a follower of mine be a burden to you. He says, come to me, all of you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You see, Jesus knows who we are, but maybe more important, more important, Jesus knows what we need. And and if you're really going to be on this journey, if you're really going to go the journey of Jesus Christ, I got to tell you, it, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it, it looks like, like, like the world is against you. But what you have to know is Jesus Christ is with you.
You see, we're flawed people, and, and, and sometimes we, we come up a little bit short. And, I, and, and that's why I kind of like the Shel Silverstein, because he says uh, what, what our tendency is to do is to, to shut her up. Our tendency is to, to close the light off so that we can protect it and grow it in our life, when really we're supposed to be throwing it open. And, and, and we can get real mixed up real soon and forget that we're worshiping God and thinking that we are God. So I like that poem that they started off with. I like that poem, God's Wheel, that they started off to be. God says to me with kind of a smile. <laughs> There's a hint there that God knows ahead of time, right? Hey, how would you like to be God a while and steer the world? Oh, you know, I mean, how many times do I say, well, if I were God, I'd do this. I would do that. How would you like to be God a while and serve the world? Okay, I says, I'll give it a try. Where do I sit? How much do I get? What time is lunch? When can I quit? You see, those are the questions we ask. Instead of asking, and instead of looking at the possibilities, we look at what we can get and what we are, our parameters, how we protect ourselves. We've shuttered the doors, haven't we? For God's thrown the doors wide open. God's throw the doors wide open. Give me that wheel back. back so, give me back that wheel, says God. I don't think you're quite ready yet. I don't know about you, but I'm not always ready. But I am ready to take the step. The step of God's grace and God's peace and God's hope. The step that's led to us, that, that on that path that's led to us, first of all, by Jesus Christ. And secondly, is kept us there through God's Spirit. That's the hope we have. That's the hope we have in the Gospel, according to Shel Silverstein. Friends, I'm, I'm going to invite the praise band back up. Uh, and I don't know what the struggles are in your life and where you are and you have those struggles and, and difficulties, um, but um, you're welcome to come up and kneel at the, at the chancel rail and offer that to God in prayer. The praise band, will play, after we pray, the praise band is going to play a song, and then I'll be over here while they're playing for anointing with oil. One of the things in special prayer, if you would like it, for healing for yourself or for others, uh, for the, uh, or, or maybe, maybe it's not a healing, maybe it's just for extra prayer and an extra boost in your, uh, in your spiritual life that you might be uh, as, the, as the praise band plays that last song. I invite you to turn with me as, wait, before I do that, um, Paul White, many of you have known Paul White. He's been a member of this church. Paul and Carla White were members of this church for years and years. Even before this church was here, they, were, they went up to the church when it was up on Industrial. And Paul is moving to Branson. Um, we're going to say a special prayer, and I'm hoping Paul will be here. He's, he was at first service, and we had a prayer over him. I'm hoping he's going to be here. Uh, at the end of this service so that everybody can have a chance to go by and just uh, give Paul a hug. And um, he, his, his health isn't great. He's going to go down and he's going to live with his daughter and, and Emma. Emma's his uh, uh, grand, great-granddaughter, and she's lived with him. Uh, but Paul is moving, and this is going to be, this was, is going to be his last Sunday, and I want you to have a chance to greet him. Let's, um, let's turn to God in prayer. Oh God, what a wonderful week with a respite from the, the heat of summer to a, an August that's, um, that's temperate um, with an occasional rain to keep the, the grass and the, and the garden green. We are so thankful for the many blessings You've given us in this life. Uh, for the subtle things and small things that You've done to remind us how much You love us and have given us, um, have shed Your grace on us in a way that we don't deserve. God, we, uh, we confess that we haven't always been the people we ought to have been. Uh, sometimes we've decided we were God um, and that, that You were ours instead of us being Yours. Um, sometimes we've done things we shouldn't have, and other times we haven't done things we should have. So we ask your forgiveness for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
who gives His life for us. God, we come here uh, this morning with our own needs and our own difficulties. Some of these needs deal with physical healing. Some of them, some of them are about emotions and and feelings and difficulties we've had and how we need to give those to you as well. God, we um, we pray not only for ourselves, but we have friends and neighbors and relatives and coworkers and even even people we barely know who we know, know we need to pray for. And we need to be people with the eyes to see the miracles, the eyes to see your kingdom coming here on this earth, just as it is in heaven. And so God, we pray. We pray for the amazing things that can happen in life as people of faith. We also come with that sense of gratitude that you give us. For those people who make our lives better, we know that over the coming uh, more than a week that people will be traveling here, and, and we pray that we can be people with open hearts and open minds, that we can show the hospitality uh, that comes from being people of faith. We pray that we can... Um, uh, that people travel safely, and we pray for those who are keeping the peace. We particularly pray for local policemen and security guards and and sheriffs and, and highway patrol people. We pause and pray for those who are protesting. Pray for those, no matter what they have to say, that they can say it uh, without fear of physical harm. We pray for those who are injured in the protest this weekend. And we hope that we can all be people who can sit down and reason together, and that we can come with a humble spirit, seeking the love and the grace that you have through your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, we, we give thanks for those who make it possible for us to live in this country. And we pray for those in military service, wherever they might be, that you keep them safe that their actions may be actions of justice and of peace, that together we can sit at the table of hope. God, we give ourselves to the task of being disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, of sharing your love and grace with the world as we pray the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trust, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.